Uh, I said, uh, my father never stopped showing me how to live, how to treat people, how to be a man, and he started early. In 1979 or 1980, Dad and I were driving from our house up to Massachusetts Avenue. We lived at the bottom of a steep hill, and to get to Mass, you had to go up, then down again, and up again. And he had a stick shift Honda Accord hatchback, and there was a lot of shifting and downshifting involved. I don't know what the hell we were talking about, almost certainly baseball, when he caught my eye watching him shift. Remember, he told me, sex is fun. What? But the car, he said, is not an extension of your penis. <laughs> I was 12 years old. <laughs> then on we went up to the supermarket or wherever we were going, just one of the hundreds of pieces of prescient advice he gave me over 47 years that I had no idea what to do with at the time. One of my best friends is here, came all the way from Los Angeles, Michael Shore. Michael gave the finest public speech I've ever seen. He gave it at his dad's funeral almost exactly 12 years ago. At the time, Michael said, you know, if my dad were here for this, he'd say, ugh, when can we get out of here and get something to eat? Mm -hmm. Well, if my dad were here, he would not want to leave. Pop would have loved every eulogy, every appreciation, every Frank Mankiewicz story being told here today. He would even have loved the inaccuracies in his obits. The Washington Post did a fine job, really, of capturing the complete essence of my father, but they had one line in there that couldn't have been more wrong. In a city where the politically ambitious often let power brokers have the last laugh, the Post wrote, Frank the Mank, as friends dubbed him, was comfortable one-upping them. Okay, I said, raise your hand if you've heard anyone ever call Frank Mankiewicz Frank the Mank. <laughs> of course, no one raised their hands. All right. So I say that's what I thought. I love that they just made up that thing that just doesn't exist. What some a weird thing to make up. Some poser pretended to know my dad better than so they got was. some right. D you know, and, yeah. and 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 whatever. A good a good reporter, Adam Bernstein, wrote a good obit, but he bought that one. Right. I also love how every obit has referred to his son Ben, me, mm -hmm. as a host for the cable channel Turner Classic Movies. Cable. Yeah, I get it. My brother's on NBC and I'm not. <laughs> It's like the New York Times wants to remind me, hey, sorry your dad died. Also, you're on basic cable. Anyway, whatever you called my dad, and I'm pretty sure most of you went with Frank, the void he has left is vast. First in the greater Mankiewicz family for Patricia, for me, and for Josh, for my wife Lee, my daughter, for Patricia's four daughters and their eight grandchildren, for my friend Dan, for John Mankiewicz and his family, for the families of Tim and Nick Davis, for John Fox's family, for Peter Davis, for Don Mankiewicz, for all of us. But it's more than a family affair. Frank the Mank, I know, right? <laughs> was the backbone of so many gatherings of friends, the Hamiltons and Hanworkers, the Joyce group he led, the James Joyce group he led, the extended NPR family, the Greater Hill and Knowlton family, the Sunday softball family. My dad's loss is reverberating. It's being powerfully felt, even at age 90, by so many in so many different communities. It feels like a mafia Don's death. If the mafia's trade weren't violence, intimidation, and corruption, but wit, reasoned thinking, and a good tongue sandwich. I'm just kidding. There's no such thing as a good tongue sandwich. <laughs> I swear to God, I almost interrupted you to say that. You can interrupt me, Todd. <laughs> okay. You guys are free to laugh. Okay. Uh, the, uh, right. so, did your dad actually eat tongue sandwiches? All the time. That's his one failing. One failing, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, to be fair, I think I once ate it when I was eight or something. But I couldn't get the past that it was a tongue. My right? dad believes that I liked it, and then my mom showed it to me, showed them cutting it, because you know what it looks like? A tongue. A tongue. <laughs> <laughs> it, need, it just needs Frank Luntz. It just needs to be rebranded. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You know? Whatever. Call it something else. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray on that. Yeah. Um, I don't have any idea how that void, that awesome emptiness, can be filled. My hunch is that it can't. But I know I, and all of us, can survive it and thrive because my father did. At age 20, he was through basic training and in Europe, fighting the Nazis in the Ardennes forest, nearly losing his toes to frostbite, driving a Jeep and praying a German shell would hit the road to give him enough brief light to keep him from driving off a cliff in the blackness of a night. He saw friends alive one instant and dead the next, but he survived and thrived. He met my mom, Holly, and he had one great kid, and also my brother Josh. <laughs> he went to journalism school at Columbia Law School at Berkeley and then became an entertainment lawyer representing actors, Jay Silverheels, James Mason, and Steve McQueen among them, and he survived that too and thrived, joining the Kennedy administration, becoming Latin American director of the Peace Corps. 
That led to probably his most fulfilling job as Bobby Kennedy's press secretary, and eventually to that awful night in Los Angeles. But again, after the loss of a man who was not only his idol, but his friend, he survived and thrived. Eventually working for another man, he admired George McGovern, taking a campaign with no business even being in the race and turning it into the Democratic nominee for president. Then he was dealt a blow no one should experience, the sudden loss of his younger sister Josie. They were incredibly close, like me and my brother, and her death devastated him, but he survived and thrived. NPR followed, and Hill and Knowlton, and most importantly, the love of his life, Patricia, and her daughters, and his eight grandchildren through them. And last year, thanks to my wife, to whom my father instantly formed a lasting and meaningful connection, he got a granddaughter, Josie Mankiewicz. When Lee gave birth, Dad and Patricia were in L.A. with us. We took more than two days to name our daughter. Pop never suggested a name to us, never pressured us. He just nodded every suggestion. Hmm, sure. <laughs> then when I came home from the I hospital, see him do it. <laughs> when I came home from the hospital on night three, I told Dad we had a name. It's Josie. I said. He instantly started to cry, pumped his fist, and said, as only Dad did, "Ha ha!" <laughs> I'm so pleased he met Josie. So happy you got to see me with Lee with a family. Lee spent four straight nights with him last week in the hospital. She loved taking care of him, which she did often. And when she met him, she didn't know about fighting the Nazis. She didn't know about the Peace Corps or Bobby Kennedy, George McGovern, or NPR. She just knew this sweet, funny, kind, big-hearted man who loved her instantly and clearly wanted his son to marry this girl quickly. I didn't do it quickly, but I did it. My friend Michael said it best in an email this week. Lee and Josie were the exclamation points on an extraordinary life. I've mentioned Michael twice now, but I want to thank all my friends, Dan mentioned them earlier, who've been their best selves all month, as they always seem to be. Three of them, Mike Roseman, Michael, and Eric Smolson, have lost their dads, giant men in their lives, and each has demonstrated an enviable ability to persevere, to be good friends, good men, good fathers. I will try to follow their lead. I didn't make it through that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My father is I a didn't survivor. I did through the Josie part. <laughs> My father is a survivor. If he could thrive as he did, if he could find joy and peace and happiness in life, then I can, whether that void gets filled or not. My dad was always curious, and now I'm curious, as I know so many of you are, what it will be like not calling him with a grammar question, with an observation on UCLA basketball, or the Cardinals, his team, or the A's, mine, or with an encouraging new poll about the Colorado Senate race. And by the way, there are no encouraging polls out of Colorado. <laughs> It will be different, it will be sad, but it will be manageable because he showed me it can be. He also showed me that he was right. The car is not an extension of the penis. Because if it were, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be out on the open road driving a Hummer. <laughs> That's how you ended it. That's how I ended it.